Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. First, let's look at a couple of articles that are related to the ongoing elections in the United States. See, the process of elections in the United States and the developments over there may not be directly relevant for our exams. But however, we need to talk about certain controversial developments that have taken place during the ongoing elections in the United States and understand its impact on democracy in general. Then we should also understand how the outcomes of this election might affect India's interests. See, as you all know, this year's election in the United States is a contest between the Republican candidate Donald Trump, who is the current president of the US, and the Democrat candidate Joe Biden. Without a doubt, this has to be one of the most tightly contested elections in the US, that too in a highly polarized environment. As we have been discussing over the last couple of years, the controversial right-wing politics of Donald Trump and his blatant unapologetic polarization attempts has opened up several divides in the American society on racial and ethnic lines and as well as on religious lines. The rise of right-wing extremism in the United States on the lines of race, ethnicity and religion has posed a direct threat to minorities in the country and this highly polarized environment has posed an unprecedented challenge to American democracy. As expected, the election turned out to be a tight contest between Trump and Biden and following the completion of the voting process on election day, that is the 3rd of November, counting has already begun and this ongoing counting exercise has thrown up an inconclusive verdict as of now. Because for a candidate to be elected as the President of the United States, he or she requires a minimum of 270 seats in the Electoral College which is going to vote for the President on the 14th of December. Because see, under the American model of elections, the people do not directly cast a vote for their presidential candidate. Instead, they cast a vote for electoral members from each state who represent the respective parties and the respective presidential candidate. And these electoral members who get elected, they become part of an electoral college which in turn elects the president on the 14th of December. So even as the counting process is ongoing, it has been reported that Donald Trump has secured nearly 48% of the popular vote, whereas Joe Biden has gained a slight edge by gaining nearly 50% of the popular vote. According to projections, this roughly translates to around 213 seats for Trump and 237 seats for Biden. So clearly, both the candidates are falling just short of the magic number that is 270. And as expected, this has turned out into a very tight contest. A clear victor will emerge only when the counting process is completed after taking into account all the mail-in ballots or the mail-in votes that have come in. And this exercise might take anywhere between a few days or maybe a few more weeks. Because a few states in the United States, they keep receiving mail-in votes even after elections have completed. And counting all these mail-in votes is a time-consuming exercise, thereby delaying the results. In a regular one-sided election, this delay may not matter, but in such a tight contest, it leaves both the candidates hanging and leads to political uncertainty. In the midst of this unfolding drama, Donald Trump being Donald Trump has made a few highly controversial statements that has threatened the very foundation of American democracy. Even as the counting process is underway and even as conclusive official results are yet to emerge, Donald Trump prematurely claimed victory for himself and he even cast doubts on the electoral process by alleging fraud in the counting process. See, such statements coming from a serving president that too in a mature democracy such as the United States, right in the middle of the counting process is completely unacceptable because it leads to the undermining of the democracy and it raises aspersions and doubts over the electoral process. In such a scenario where the results are not entirely clear, the best response of an ideal candidate would be to wait patiently for the official results to emerge. And he or she should refrain from making any such premature and controversial statements which can be deemed to be highly irresponsible because such statements leads to the undermining of the democracy and the elections. And the United States, being one of the world's oldest and largest democracies, has great responsibility to champion the cause of democracy. And this faith in the United States has been eroded as a result of Trump's controversial statements. The irony is that the United States 
has always positioned itself as a champion of democracy and it has always preached democracy for other countries and it has even tried to enforce democracy in other countries. But today, what we are witnessing is the emergence of a dysfunctional democracy in the United States thanks to irresponsible politics which has polarized the American society. The premature claiming of victory by Donald Trump and his unsubstantiated allegations of electoral fraud could even lead to social unrest, violence and riots in the country because as I said, it might take a few more days or maybe even a few more weeks for clear results to emerge and this period of political uncertainty might last until January thereby giving enough scope for the emergence of a legal and constitutional crisis in the United States. Because Donald Trump has already made it clear that he is going to approach the Supreme Court and legally challenge the electoral process in order to put an end to the counting of mail-in votes. Because according to Trump, there has been a serious fraud that has been committed in the postal ballot system. While he has not presented any evidence to substantiate his claims, his threat to open a legal challenge and take the matter to the Supreme Court will definitely lead to political uncertainty that might prolong for a few days or few weeks and it could result in the emergence of a legal and constitutional crisis. So this crisis facing the United States clearly highlights the flaws in the electoral process of the United States as well. Because see, there are numerous legal loopholes and grey areas in the American electoral process that could be easily misused especially in such circumstances. First of all, the electoral process in the US gets dragged for nearly three months stretching all the way from November to January. The usual schedule is that in November the elections are held, mail-in votes are received throughout the election period, counting takes place and then in December the electoral college meets to elect the president and in January the president-elect is announced and on the 20th of January the new administration takes over on the inauguration day. But however, this long process gives sufficient scope for intervention and disruption which could affect the counting of the postal ballots thereby leading to suppression of votes. Along with this, the United States being a strong federation where the federal states are given more powers and where they are given a lead role in the conduct of elections, each state has come up with its own system and this lack of uniformity also delays the counting process. The lack of uniformity and the differences also adds to the complexity of the American election process and upon this, judicial intervention in the electoral process is also permitted even before the results are declared. Now contrast this with Indian elections. Thanks to the Constitution of India and the Autonomous Election Commission of India, elections in India are held in a very efficient and simple manner and at the end of counting, it provides for decisive and clear-cut results and even if there is a hung parliament, there are enough opportunities to form a coalition government and provide for political stability as soon as possible. See, due to India's large size, diversity and geographical complexities, the election process is divided into multiple phases. Even in India, voting takes place for months together, nearly one and a half to two months. But however, counting is concluded in a single day across the country and by evening, the conclusive results are officially announced by the Election Commission of India. This is made possible because of the several unique systems and methods that has been developed by the Election Commission of India and it provides for a uniform system of voting and counting that makes the entire electoral process very simple and less complicated and helps in providing conclusive results in a single day. Plus moreover, the constitution prohibits the judiciary from interfering with the electoral process until the results are announced and cases can be filed at the High Court and the Supreme Court only after the results have been announced. In contrast, the delayed counting in the American electoral system, the long process that stretches nearly three months and the possibility of judicial intervention leaves enough scope for certain candidates to misuse this legal grey area and further perpetuate political uncertainty in order to swing the results in their favour. Now let's take up another editorial from page number 6 which deals with the topic of star campaigner. See, during elections, every political party is allowed to designate its senior leaders and as well as most popular leaders of the party as star campaigners and this status of a star campaigner is recognized by the Election Commission of India because the status of a star campaigner brings in a certain amount of privileges. 
these privileges that are extended to the star campaigner by the election commission of india are very useful for the political party in its campaign so let's understand what sort of privileges a star campaigner can enjoy see under section 77 of the representation of people act of 1951 expenditure related to election campaigning has been covered and it also allows the election commission of india to lay down expenditure limits for each candidate in a particular constituency but this expenditure limit prescribed by the election commission is quite low and it is only sufficient for the candidate to meet his electoral expenses the election commission has prescribed a separate expenditure limit for assembly elections and for lok sabha elections and this limit varies from state to state but however this expenditure limit is barely sufficient to meet the expenses of the candidate of that constituency so there is no way in which the candidate of a constituency can afford the expenses involved in bringing in the star campaigner of the party because a star campaigner will have to travel a lot more in order to cover more constituencies and they may have to make use of helicopters as well so to account for this increased cost and to provide for more flexibility to parties in their spending the election commission of india provides a certain set of privileges to those who have been designated as a star campaigner of the party the privilege is that the expenses incurred by the party on the star campaigner shall not be counted as a part of the candidate's expenditure in that constituency so this helps the party and the candidate to bring in a star campaigner without breaching the expenditure limit and provides flexibility to the parties in their electoral spending but however those political leaders who have been designated as the star campaigners of the party they need to strictly abide by the model code of conduct that has been laid down by the election commission of india the model code clearly states that while campaigning the star campaigners cannot resort to hate speech they cannot carry out personal attacks against opposition parties especially with regard to their private life this topic is recently in news because congress leader kamal nath recently made a controversial statement against a women candidate of the opposition party and since this was a breach of the model code of conduct the election commission of india decided to revoke the star campaigner status of mr kamal nath so this power of the election commission of india to revoke the star campaigner status is an integral part of its power to control and direct the conduct of elections in order to ensure that elections are conducted in a free and fair manner but after the election commission revoked the star campaigner status of kamal nath the supreme court has intervened and it has issued a stay order on the revocation of the star campaigner status of mr kamal nath according to the editorial this is a direct intervention of the judiciary with the autonomous powers of the election commission say so it is true that the model code of conduct does not have any legal mandate of its own since it is not backed by any law it is not enforceable by the election commission but however the election commission has always cited one of the observations of the supreme court itself with regard to the invocation of one's residuary powers residuary powers are nothing but the powers and functions that are not specified through any law because the law makers may not have foreseen such situations in such a case the authority concerned can invoke their residuary powers in order to fulfill their mandate and responsibilities on many occasions the supreme court itself has made use of its residuary powers while passing judgments so the election commission has also cited the same observation of the supreme court while enforcing the model code of conduct by relying upon its residuary powers but right now the supreme court has intervened and issued a stay order on the revocation of the star campaigner status thereby directly interfering with the powers of the election commission of india the editorial takes a stand against this judicial intervention in the functioning of the election commission of india because this could threaten and disrupt the conduct of free and fair elections now let's take up another column from page number 6 written by arun maira a former member of the erstwhile planning commission of india in this column the writer talks about the income crisis and the income divide that is facing the country the writer argues that the income of a majority of people in the country falls in the low category he points out that incomes of people in the lower half of the pyramid is extremely low whereas the top 1% of the pyramid represented by wealthy investors have extremely high incomes and they represent the ultra rich 
So this essentially is a representation of the stark income divide in the country. A majority of the population has very very low incomes whereas a small percentage of the population who are at the top of the pyramid, they are the ultra rich who essentially control the factors of production and the markets. So to address this challenge, economists have generally suggested three solutions. One is to free up the markets from excessive government regulation. Two, to focus on improving productivity in the industry and in the overall economy. And three, to introduce technology so that productivity can be ramped up and a level playing field can be created. But however, the writer says that such traditional economic solutions are not sufficient to address this massive challenge and hence he calls upon the government to fix the fundamentals of the game and change the rules of the economy in order to ensure that the rules that are currently favoring the wealthy investors starts favoring the workers and the tiny and small enterprises. According to him, this is the one sure shot way of bridging the income divide and this approach should be focused on ensuring the overall well-being of the worker. See the writer says that when markets are freed up, the general argument is that agricultural products can be directly sold by the farmers in the market thereby leading to an increase in their income. But however, one cannot ignore the fact that in such a free market, farmers might actually be exploited by the big industries because of their much larger bargaining power which doesn't exist with the farmers. This is especially true in a country like India where a majority of the farmers are small and marginal. Then similarly, it is argued that the labor sector has to be freed up in order to attract more investments. So freeing up of the labor sector would mean that subjecting the workers to the larger bargaining power of the big industries and this could directly compromise their wages instead of increasing them. In a completely free labor market, humans are essentially treated as just another commodity who can be traded to the highest bidder. The argument for free markets is based on the fact that freeing up regulations in agriculture and labor helps improve demand, thereby attracting more investments. But according to the writer, this logic contradicts itself because if investors are attracted due to free market reforms, then they would definitely exploit the humans by using their larger bargaining power and treat the workers as just commodities who can be traded, thereby leading to an overall reduction in their wages instead of an improvement in their wages. Then coming to the traditional solution of improving productivity, the writer says that productivity is nothing but the measurement of overall output over the given input. In case of the whole economy, productivity is measured via labor productivity that is nothing but GDP divided by the number of people in the system. Whereas in the case of companies or factories, productivity is measured as a ratio of the total output divided by the number of workers. In such a concept of productivity, the one way in which companies improve their productivity is by hiring and firing workers as and when needed. When the market conditions are right and when the company is looking to improve productivity, they might hire people. Similarly, when the market conditions are adverse, they might fire people at random. And hence it is said that companies tend to improve their productivity just by modifying the number of workers in the company instead of focusing on improving their output. According to the writer, this is a flawed methodology of measuring productivity and hence he calls upon the industry and the government to make productivity a factor of capital. He says that productivity in a company should be measured as a ratio of the total output per unit of capital that is invested by the investor. In this case, the company would be motivated to bring in more capital so that more technology and more workers could be brought in in order to improve the overall output of the company. But however, the writer cautions about the introduction of technology as well because when technology is introduced, it usually tends to replace manpower leading to a loss of jobs. See, introducing machines and modern technology is definitely capital intensive for the investors but in most cases it is done to replace manpower and save the company's expenditure on salaries. So this approach doesn't increase the income of the workers, instead they might lose their jobs. And hence, the writer calls for a radical shift in the approach towards reforms. He says that technology should be introduced not to replace the worker but to improve his skills so that the worker and the machine combined can improve productivity of the industry and bring benefits to both the investors and as well as to the workers themselves. 
So the writer's basic argument is that any attempt to bridge the income divide should essentially focus on the worker and both the government and the investor, they need to give this priority to the worker. Because when the government and the investors are investing in the worker, then it leads to an improvement in the skills of the worker and in the long run, it improves the productivity of the economy and the company. This is a mutually win-win situation because improved skill set will also translate to higher income for the worker while bringing better productivity for the industry and the economy. Now let's take up the practice questions for today. Which of the following provisions can be found in the POCSO Act? POCSO stands for Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act. So does it contain provisions to protect children from offences of sexual assault, stringent punishment for child pornography, safeguard the interests of the child at every stage of the judicial process by incorporating child-friendly mechanisms for reporting, recording of evidence, investigation, etc. Explicitly prevent child marriages. Amongst the given statements, the fourth provision is not explicitly laid out in the POCSO Act, whereas the other three are contained in the legislation Hence, option D would be the right answer. This question has been asked because on page number 1, we have an article where the POCSO Act finds a mention. According to this article, the Supreme Court is looking to constitute a special court where lawmakers can be tried separately for their alleged crimes. Now, let's take up the next question. National Highway 306 or NH 306 is a critical highway for which states? The correct answer is option C. Assam and Mizoram. Please look at this map. Here you can find National Highway 306. It basically connects Silchar in Assam with key towns in Mizoram. This highway is considered to be the lifeline of Mizoram. This highway is frequently in news because of the ongoing dispute between Assam and Mizoram over their border issue. Now let's take up the next question. Which was the first language to be given the status of classical language of India? Was it Sanskrit, Tamil, Kannada or Telugu? The correct answer is option B, Tamil. See, the government accords the classical language status to a particular language based on its ability to fulfill a certain criteria. As per this criteria, the language should be of extraordinary antiquity and its earliest transcripts and inscriptions should date back to at least 1500 to 2000 years ago. There should also be a vast body of ancient literature and texts which is considered as valuable heritage and it should also have a literary tradition that is unique to itself and it should not have been hired or drawn directly from another language community. And since a classical language has to be distinct from modern language, there has to be a clear discontinuity in the different forms of the language that can be seen in that particular literature. So based on these criteria, in 2004, the government of India accorded the classical language status to the language of Tamil then this was followed by Sanskrit in 2005, Kannada and Telugu in 2008, Malayalam in 2013 and Odia in 2014. This question has been asked because we have a column on page number 7 which evaluates whether linguistic nationalism is on the decline in the country. The article is particularly focused on linguistic nationalism and regionalism that is based on the Kannada language and the writer goes on to suggest a few ways through which the rich heritage and culture of the Kannada language can be revived, which enjoys the classical status. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following methods were adopted under the non-cooperation movement? Revival of Swadeshi, boycott of foreign goods, establishment of direct trade relations with friendly foreign countries, boycott of the councils. All the four are correct. Option D is the right answer. This question has been asked because the 100 years ago article on page number 7 makes a reference to the non-cooperation movement. See, the non-cooperation movement was launched by Mahatma Gandhi as a direct response to the Rolath Act in coordination with the Khilafat movement that had taken root. And the non-cooperation movement extended to all the forms of non-cooperation that has been mentioned in the options given in the question. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following statements are correct? The CBI automatically enjoys country-wide jurisdiction to investigate cases. This statement is clearly incorrect because the CBI does not automatically enjoy country-wide jurisdiction. This jurisdiction has to be individually granted by each state and this provision is contained in the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act. Just look at the second statement. The Delhi Special Police Establishment Act 
which provides for the constitution of the CBI, makes consent of the state government mandatory for conducting CBI investigation in that state. So obviously, this statement is correct. And the third statement says that there are two kinds of consent, that is case-specific consent and general consent. Even this statement is correct, so option D is the right answer. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 8, Kerala has also withdrawn general consent given to the CBI. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following statements are correct? The National Defence College in New Delhi provides training only for military officers. It admits officers only from the Indian Armed Forces. Both the statements are incorrect. Option D is the right answer. See, the National Defence College in New Delhi provides training, especially in strategic courses and on issues related to international relations and national security to not just military officers, but also to civil servants, especially to those who are above the rank of joint secretaries. And it also provides training and courses, not just to Indian soldiers and Indian civil servants, but also to foreign officers from friendly countries. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following statements are correct with regard to the nurturing neighborhoods challenge? It aims to develop and implement initiatives to improve the quality of life in cities for young children, caregivers and families. It will be open for 100 smart cities, cities with population of more than 5 lakh and as well as for state and union territory capitals. It is implemented by the Union Ministry for Housing and Urban Affairs. All the three statements are correct. Option C is the right answer. This question has been asked because the Nurturing Neighbourhoods Challenge has been mentioned in an article on page number 9. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following statements are correct? The only country to have signed, ratified and later withdrawn from the Paris Agreement is the United States. Article 28 of the Agreement enables parties to withdraw from the Agreement. Both the statements are correct. Option C is the right answer. See, Article 28 of the Paris Agreement provides the withdrawal process from the Agreement. According to this Agreement, once a country has signed and ratified the agreement, it has to remain in force for at least three years and during this period, a country cannot issue a withdrawal notice. After three years of operation of the Paris Agreement, the country has the right to withdraw from it by issuing a notice and once the withdrawal notice is issued, the entire withdrawal process will take one more year. So basically under the Paris Agreement, a country which has signed and ratified the agreement is bound to implement it for at least four years. Another way in which a country withdraws from the Paris Agreement is by withdrawing itself from the Climate Change Convention itself. Because see, the Paris Agreement has been worked out under the Climate Change Convention and hence, when a country withdraws from the Climate Change Convention, it can automatically withdraw from the Paris Agreement as well. And the conditions for withdrawal from the Climate Change Convention is similar to the conditions for withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. And in case of withdrawal, the Paris Agreement does not specify any penal provisions for that country. This topic is in news because according to this article on page number 13, the United States has formally completed the exit process from the Paris Agreement. In 2017, the Trump administration declared its intent to quit the Paris Agreement as it considered the treaty to be unfair to the United States. But it could not issue a withdrawal notice because of the three-year lock-in period. The US had signed and ratified the agreement in 2016. Hence, it had to wait until 2019 to issue the withdrawal notice. So last year in November, the withdrawal notice was issued and one year later, the United States has formally quit the Paris Agreement. Now let's take up a practice question from the 2018 Films paper. See over here, a long description has been given that refers to one of the emerging communication technologies. I want you to go through this once. The technology described over here is essentially Internet of Things or IoT which provides for the interlinking and networking of several smart devices and appliances that makes possible home automation and office automation. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, evaluate the impact of electoral uncertainty in the United States on India's interests. The second question, India has an income crisis. Incomes of people in the lower half of the pyramid are too low. The current system favors wealthy investors and not workers and tiny enterprises. So in the light of the statement, suggest measures to fix the problem. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below. This concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.